When I think of magic, I think of less, oh, I'm just going to accept fate, and magic is a little bit more, well, the energy seems to be moving this way, I want it to move a little bit more this way. How can we close that gap? How does a person use I Ching as a magical tool? So the, the very, very short way of putting the I Ching is that it's the oldest continually used book in history. It's 3,000 years old. And it it's a guide to understanding reality and to understanding yourself. And it was the foundation of all Chinese and therefore all other Asian philosophy. The, the I Ching was, was hugely influential, not just in China. It was, it, was a, it was very big in Korea, because as you said, Korea was, at least at a certain point, you know, in the, you know, uh, what was it, the, the, from the Koryo dynasty onwards, right, it was, it was hugely Confucian, right, um, and, and also in Japan, right, it got to Japan, and there were translations, very unusual translations of the I Ching, and they use a different, they also use stocks, right? It's sort of like what happened with Crowley, right? Where they they saw Chinese um, sage, I guess it probably, I don't know if it was Japanese traders or diplomats or whatever that had gone to China and they saw um, Chinese diviners using the gyro stocks and separating them and counting them, but then nobody would teach them how to do it, right? Probably because they were foreigners, right? And so they kind of tried to look at it and see how it works. And to this day, the method, the traditional Japanese method of how you count the euro stocks is different. You use a different method to, to develop the, uh, the the hexagrams than the actual, you know, the traditional euro stock method uh, because of that, right? So they, they kind of like had to alter it. And it changed in little ways in different parts of where it is. Like I know, I don't know too much about it, but I know, for example, that in Southeast Asia, like Thailand and Vietnam, the I Ching also was very influential to like local spiritual movements and religious movements and ideas and, and to their forms of magic. And they use other methods also for divining the I Ching. So it, it had a huge and broad spanning influence, which is a kind of a testament to how universal it is, right? And the fact that also we in the West, if, if we get over kind of um, – being obsessively sinological about it, because sinology, sinology is the study of China, right? Um, I think a mistake people make is thinking, well, you have to try to be really Chinese to understand the I Ching. And it sounds as though I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly uh, educated about Chinese history and about all this sort of thing. But um, I, in actual fact, I don't think of the structure of the I Ching as Chinese. It's, it's version, I mean, the book, the I Ching as a book is Chinese, yes. And so you have to know a little bit about that. But you're not going to find the secrets of understanding the I Ching by, you know, obsessively studying the Chinese language or Chinese culture. Um, you're going to, the, because the secret of the I Ching is fundamentally mathematical. And so it's something that you'll find in all human experience. And that's why even when, like, even in the Middle Ages, or I mean, a little bit, a little bit after the Middle Ages, in the early modern period, when when missionaries came to China from from Europe, um, they looked at, you know, we're talking about in the 17th and 18th century, they saw the I Ching, and they were kind of like amazed by it, right? They took it to be proof of God, right? And and there was this theory that was going along in the church at that time, that was very big with the missionaries that had gone to China, that um, of that in the, the heathen peoples that were not Christian, um, God had to have left signs for them to discover God, right? Proofs that they could then use to, to help convert these heathens to Christianity, right? And the missionaries that saw the I Ching and learned it, you know, because they had to learn the language and all this, and they, they, they obviously studied the philosophical texts <clears throat> in order to make good arguments to learned people in China. They had to be learned in Chinese stuff, right? And so they... They, they, when they read the I Ching, they thought, okay, this is absolutely it. This is proof. This is something God gave the Chinese as proof of his existence, right? Because it was that impressive. Uh, the reason for it is because it's a mathematical structure that if, if, we, if we look at it beyond the words itself, 
has a universal human appeal. This is, for example, one of the reasons why in, in the West today, and this is something I kind of only discovered after I wrote this book, um, there's a large number of people in the black community that are very interested in Iching. And they're interested in it in part because they see similarities between that and the Ifa system of divination, which is also a mathematical system of divination that developed in Africa. There are some kind of like schools of kind of black origin thought, you could say, that believe that the I Ching actually was originally African and it was like brought by black people to China, right? And uh, there's not really any historical proof of that. But what you see is that there's this like, this appeal that goes all over the place, right? It, it, it's in, um, it, it's regardless of your race, it's regardless of your ethnicity, or it's regardless of where in the world you live. In South America, I Ching is huge, right? In Africa, it's 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 becoming bigger and bigger. It's it's been big in Europe and North America for a long time now, right? So it's it's a universal text. So knowing this. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of people who are going to be like, okay, I'm like ready to jump into this. I'm ready to incorporate I Ching into my life. So they're going to get your book. And then what do they do? What's the next step? Okay. Well, in my book, I actually provide an appendix. I'm trying to remember which appendix it was here. It's uh, appendix one, I think. You'd think it would be. Oh, yeah. Appendix one, setting up a daily I Ching practice. And so... This is kind of the very basic step, right, of what you would want to do with um, with the I Ching if you want to, you know, seriously approach it, right? You're not just kind of like doing it for, for you know, fun at a party or something like that, uh, which is kind of what happened at first, right? Like in the, 19, in the 1960s, that was when I Ching really started taking off, and it was mostly hippies getting stoned and then casting the I Ching badly at parties, you know, of rock music was playing in the background or something like that. But um, there were always some people who were taking it more serious than that. And and nowadays, I hope there's there's more people that will take it more seriously. One of the things is don't, don't worry just about, like, casting the I Ching. A lot of, I've seen a lot of other books on the I Ching that say, well, you should cast the I Ching every day, right? You should do an I Ching reading every day. And uh, I don't think that at all, because then what you're doing is you're banalizing it, right? You're making it something mundane, right? You should you should cast the I Ching when you have an, a, a question that you need an answer for. Now, it doesn't have to be a highfalutin sort of question, right? It doesn't have to be a question about, like, life, the universe, and everything. It might just be something like, you know, uh, you've lost your keys, right? Where, where are my keys, right? It could, be, it could be about something ordinary, right? Like, oh should I be worried about this pain in my leg or not, right? Or something like that. Um, but it should be a question that matters to you because part of divination is, it, part of all magic is a combination of awareness and of necessity, right? So if you don't have an actual need, it's very hard for magic to really function well, right? The more intense the necessity is, the more effective the process becomes because it allows you, that necessity allows you to have that kind of concentration that almost approaches a trance state that lets you perform the casting. So I tell people, don't do the I Ching casting every day. Do it when you have a question. And it can be a, a, an ordinary sort of question, or it can be kind of a deeper question, right? Like, what am I supposed to do with my life? Or something like that, right? Or what's the nature of God? Or whatever you want. But um, for a day-to-day -day thing, what I tell people is, and this is amazing that I have to tell people this, but I've seen in my life probably hundreds of people that said that they were into I Ching at different varying levels, including some people who claimed to be really, you know, to be good enough that they were trying to charge people for I Ching readings that had never actually read the text from cover to cover, right? Yeah. Like they would just, you know, they would have the book there as a reference file. They'd cast the I Ching and then look up the hexagram that was there and do that. So the first thing I tell people is, uh, what you want to do first is just kind of generally read the whole book, but just in a very relaxed way, right? Don't don't be, don't get intensely worried about trying to, to to know everything, because this is a living text. It's a very complex um, magical text that you are like most magical texts. The first time you read it, like most sacred scriptures, like most grimoires, and most stuff like that, the first time you read it, you're going to miss ninety percent of it, or you're not going to be able to understand it. You're, you're going to get little glimpses of it. 
and that's okay. You don't have to worry about it. It's not like a novel. It's not, it's not something where you've got to understand it all the first time you read it. You're going to read it a lot, right? So then after that, I tell people to pick one hexagram per day and to read the whole entry on that hexagram and to kind of spend time thinking about it and then to spend time not really thinking about it, but just kind of having it on your mind, right? So <clears throat> you start to like kind of try to look for um, moments in your day that might have something to do with what you read about that hexagram. So you start to kind of learn about ordinary situations in nature. That is by nature, I mean, not just like, you know, woodland creatures or things like that, but like in your day-to-day -day life um, that apply to that hexagram. And that's how you start really learning what that hexagram applies to, right? This is not something I invented. It's really something that like all of the ancient masters of I Ching did and taught, and we have records of that sort of thing, right? Like Xiaoyang was one of the greatest, you know, the Song Dynasty was the, the, the pinnacle of Chinese civilization, and it was the pinnacle of I Ching studies, right? And Xiaoyang was one of the great masters of that dynasty. Uh, he's the one that developed the Plum Blossom system of numerology, which is also in the appendix to my book, right? Or in the later chapters of my book. So it's kind of an advanced method. Um, and there's a story about Xiaoyang. He was teaching his son about the I Ching, right? And uh, one day uh, in the night, in the evening already, you had um, his neighbor had, was, cut, was coming towards the house. He saw his neighbor approaching. Right. And so he he told his son, um, OK, quickly do an I Ching casting and find out what it is that um, that the, the neighbor wants. Right. And the son goes and he does an I Ching casting and he gets a certain hexagram. He said something like, oh, he wants a, I think he said something like, oh, he, he wants a shovel. Right. Because he, the, the combination of the. The, the hexagram of the, of the trigrams, the elements, indicated something metal, right, and a tool. And uh, Xiaoyang said, oh, that's, that's very good, but that's not what he wants, right? Um, he's, he's going to want an axe, right? And then the neighbor knocks on the door and, and he asks for an axe, right? And, um, and the son said, well, how, how, why did I get that wrong? How did you know it and I didn't? He said, well, because you weren't paying attention, right? Um, you use a shovel for, for farm work. And right now it's nighttime and it's winter. He wanted an axe because his axe broke and he needed to cut wood for the fire, right? Which is something you do at night and in winter, right? So paying attention to your surroundings will help you get more profoundly connected to these individual hexagrams. And then after you've kind of like looked through the whole, um, all of the, you, you know, you've looked at one at a time at the hexagrams, the 64, just the basic descriptions of them. Then what you really want to do is spend time kind of um, looking at the, the permutations of them, right? Compare two hexagrams to each other. Look at the changing lines of a hexagram that lead to another hexagram and why, right? So there's all this study that, that is a big part of it. And part of what you need to do, and this is absolutely essential, I put it in capital letters in, in my appendix, is keep a diary. You want to write down your thoughts as you're doing this study. In any kind of magical practice, it's essential to keep a diary, to keep a record of what you're doing. Because there's stuff that you won't otherwise remember. And because writing helps you to remember. And because then later you can look back, you know, six months later at what you were writing before. And the first really important thing about that is that you open it up. And you look and you say, man, I was dumb, right? <laughs> like, what, what was I thinking when I wrote this, right? And it lets you realize in a way that you might not otherwise have noticed how much you've developed, how much you've already learned, and how much you've spiritually grown in those six months or whatever period of time, right? Because since it happens very gradually, day by day. You might think you haven't gotten very far. But when, if you can look back at a, at a moment in time from the past, then it can give you a much better perspective of exactly how far you've come, right? It also requires you to kind of keep more disciplined, and discipline is one of the foundations of virtue. So that's very important. And I would also, like I said, strongly recommend that anyone who studies the I Ching should have a daily practice that is a cultivation practice of some kind, whether that's um, meditation or something like Qigong, 
or yoga, but not, you know, just kind of stretching yoga, right? Like the spiritual yoga, right? Something along those lines, because you have to be working on gradually expanding your awareness. The I Ching will reveal more mysteries to you the more you grow as a person. So that if you then go back, you know, a year later after the first time, let's say you listened to me and read the book cover to cover, and then a year later you read it again. If you've been developing, if you've been developing in your consciousness, the second time you read it, you're going to suddenly see it. it. It looks like a totally different book. You're seeing insights you didn't see before. You're seeing stuff you swear you didn't read the first time around, right? There's like stuff that suddenly appears to you and stuff that makes sense that made no sense before, but only if you've been cultivating, if you've been practicing and, and not just, you know, kind of, well, I read it and then I just kind of sat there and didn't change, right? It depends on your changing whether or not the book is going to change and show you new mysteries. And then beyond that, if you really want to get advanced, well, you, you should consider going into um, a curriculum of training with a teacher, like, for example, the Yifa Society, which is the, the school that I have um, been using for, for my students, a curriculum, a whole system of training, not just in studying the I Ching, but also a, um, a set of Qigong practices and and in the higher levels of that curriculum, we begin doing actual you know, magic that is based on the I Ching principles. Some people who already have a magical practice, um, and they're like, oh my God, you know, the I Ching sounds fascinating, but do I have to give up my, I don't know, my altars to, I'm working with Hecate, for example. So it's like, how would somebody incorporate I Ching in a way that's not just fluffy and superficial, that has some substance to it? How would they incorporate that with what they're already doing? That's a, that's a very good question. And um, fundamentally, the I Ching doesn't, studying the I Ching doesn't necessarily require giving up anything else you're doing, certainly not in a magic practice, unless you're in one of these like, weird groups that says you can't read anything except what the supreme teacher tells you to. And uh, if that's the case, I'd probably suggest not a good plan, right? Don't, don't stick around there. Um, any guru that, that tells you you shouldn't read something else is probably uh, probably worried about something, right? Um, so the, the I Ching does not require, first of all, that you suddenly, you know, that you try to be a, fake Chinese person or something like that. It doesn't require that you suddenly put up a, yeah, certainly not an altar to the Buddha because the Buddha had very little to do with teaching, right? Or, or uh, you know, an altar to the Chinese gods or something like that. Um, because it's, it's the, the I Ching is remarkably, um, it, it's not atheistic by any means because it certainly has a cosmology and it's certainly just like, but it, it's very, it's remarkably free of deities, right? Um, and, and in fact, uh, Zhuzhi, who was one of the, the greatest masters of the Yi one of the greatest philosophers of the Chinese, of all of Chinese history, like in Chinese history, Zhuzhi is considered second only to Confucius, right? And he's the only, the only guy who now has a shrine in the temple of the Confucian immortals that wasn't someone from Confucius' own lifetime, right? He, he was born, what would that be, like more than 1,500 years after Confucius, right? But, uh, but he, was, he was huge, right? And he said kind of paraphrasing here because I don't remember the exact word. It's certainly not true that there's that there isn't some kind of bearded gentleman in the sky that that is determining all of our fates. But um, there is certainly a force that um, that we can understand and connect to, right? Like so it's something along those lines. That was the, the intent of what he was saying. Which is a, an incredibly when you think about it, he was saying this in I think it would be the eleventh century, right? So this was at a time where Christians and Muslims were slaughtering each other over their bearded guy in the sky, right? Um, so the Chinese under, always kind of understood their gods, at least certainly by the imperial period, understood their gods as kind of archetypal forces. And um, even though, you know, the common people might have looked at them in, the, in a very literal sense in the same way that a common peasant in medieval Europe looked at Jesus in a very literal sense. But there's also always that other level to it, right? And it doesn't really matter which deities you work with um, to also be working with the I Ching. Again, unless, you know, you're, you're, if you're a fundamentalist Christian, it might matter, right? Unless it's something about that deity, right? But it, it, it isn't something where you have to, like, stop your existing practices, right? And 
But I also think that a lot of Western magicians or Western pagans or what have you have until now only thought of and only looked at the I Ching as a substitute tarot. Okay? And probably a tarot they don't understand as well. And it doesn't have pretty pictures, so it's less, you know, less yeah. popular, right? Um, but the I Ching is actually this, this, this whole system. And I, and I think that you can certainly incorporate more parts of that system into your magical practice. And as far as the kind of um, your spiritual practice goes, you can incorporate the teachings that are found in the I Ching, right? Those, those teachings about the superior individual and the inferior person, the teachings about how elements interact, and the teachings about what it tells, tells you about the nature of space and time, because those are, those are things that aren't um, just kind of a theory. They're, they're not just kind of a theoretical model. There's something that is that, that comes out of this incredibly profound space of wisdom, right? Like the I Ching is a binary code, right? It's zeros and ones. In this case, well, one and two, we, they call it, right? But it's the same as the code that's in all of our computing, right? So back when in the in the 17th century, when these Jesuit priests discovered the I Ching, one of them translated it into Latin and sent that to Leibniz, the, the European philosopher, right? Leibniz was the European philosopher who discovered binary mathematics, right? In Europe, discovered in Europe, right? And this was in the 17th century. And when they sent him this text, that they, they, they didn't know exactly how old it was, but they knew that it was, by then, it was at least 2,000 years old. They knew that much, right? And they, he, he was flabbergasted. He just couldn't believe it. He became obsessed with the I Ching after that because here the, the Chinese had discovered something in mathematics that, that he didn't discover until just then, just that time in his own lifetime. When we develop more and more, a lot of what the I Ching is saying, and I don't want to go into like this kind of Deepak Chopra quantum woo level, right? <laughs> but what it says about the nature of space and time um, is something that seems to be more and more confirmed by the scientific understanding of space and time. And to the point that all of the founders of quantum physics, Niels Bohr and Schrodinger, you know, the guy with the cat, um, all of these guys read the I Ching and they were fascinated by it. And it deeply influenced their development of quantum, of quantum physics to the point that when Niels Bohr was honored by his home country, Denmark, I think, he was honored with a knighthood. You know, when you get a knighthood, you have to have a, a family crest. And because he was a commoner, he didn't have one. And so on his new crest as a knight, what did he put? He put the Taiji, the, the Tao, the symbol of yin and yang. And he said, because this symbol to me is the best traditional symbol that reflects my understanding of reality. Right? So, so this is something that you can apply in a way that um, will help you understand reality better and therefore understand how to approach any kind of spiritual practice, including kind of devotional practice to a deity, or how do you work with the deity, right? The ancient Chinese used I Ching in a divination sense to know when to perform certain rituals as well. So they would know if it was the right time or the wrong time to perform a sacrifice or to, um, you know, to perform a ritual to bring rain or things like that. And I think that that's another very practical way that if you're a Western magician, um, you should consider the I Ching as a way to, 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 to give you a perspective on whether it's a good idea to do a, a ritual or how to do a ritual or when to do a ritual. And in particular, the plum blossom method can give you like a kind of a specific outlook on a given day, right? Or even a given day, an hour or a two hour period rather, right? So you can determine the most auspicious time for this. Housewives in Korea that's, are that's learning Saju. Like Korean, um, there's a system that's similar to Saju in Chinese stuff. It's not I Ching. Saju is like you look at your. It's almost like a natal chart, but it's with Chinese characters and hexagrams in it, and it, you find out through your Saju like what your life is like, what your personality is like, what your fortune well, is. Well, that, that sounds partly like plum blossom numerology. Right? That might be. That might be very similar. Which, like, which is in my book. It's, uh -huh. in, it's one of the, the later chapters of my book where I, I, I show you how to calculate your your hex your hexagrams from your natal you know from your date and an hour of birth right and and how what those reflect about you and then you can compare them to later periods of time yes. to see 
or where you're at, right? So it's it's basically that, right? It's haju. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what it is. So, that's exactly what haju is. It's, so it's like, and then you could see I, like I think of a Chinese word for it. I think it's meikua or something like that. But uh, but it's uh, yeah. In, in, in English, it's plum blossom. It's called the plum blossom method or plum blossom numerology. Yeah. I think it's called haju in Korean because there's sa means four, and there's like four something, four strains or something like that. And it's like it tells you stuff like, oh, you know, like uh, in this part of your years, um, you're gonna have more metal or something like that in your yeah, system. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely yeah. It's the same thing because it looks because it uses not just the eight mm -hmm. elements of the trigrams, but also what are what what sometimes people call the five Chinese elements, but are really like those are the five phases, right? Which mm -hmm. are which are that they're metal and earth and fire and water. And, yeah. Mainly, I think it's because if you're doing magic. Unless you're doing it in a completely sort of um, self self referencing, self absorbed sort of way, you just want to do magic because you hope that it'll let you curse your enemies and get sex and money or something like that, right? Unless you're doing that, most people who are doing magic is because they want to change um, they want to change their lives. Some of them might not even realize that they're doing it because they want to change their lives, um, or that they want to change themselves, especially. But but they're what's drawing you to it is that you want to you want things to be different than they are and therefore you want to be different than you are sometimes there's this conflict right that's the inferior person what the inferior person wants is for things to change but not have to change yourself okay right? you want to keep being the same asshole but you want you want everything around you to get better right and and you don't realize that those things are united and that they're dependent on each other right but if you understand that magic is in part an effort to change yourself, then the philosophy of the I Ching about how to change yourself and how to know the right way to make a choice at any given moment in space and time is really fundamental to help you along in that development, you know, in that path. It seems as though a huge part of the benefit of using the I Ching is that there's thousands of years of commentary by brilliant philosophers so yeah no, that sort of thing might only be really accessible to people who are kind of academically inclined mm -hmm. and they're only really useful to people who have already kind of gotten to a certain level of at least intermediate level of study right so i'm not saying so i don't want to scare people into thinking oh well if i have to send that method if i want to learn the each i have to like read all of the collected writings of confucius and all this stuff right and that, that's not the case right like I tried to write the magician's I Ching as completely as possible for a practical use, right? Like, I'm not saying it's an advanced book, but it's a, it's a book that you can use totally as a beginner. That's the only book you're going to need to start, <clears throat> and it'll it'll work with you all the way through, like the intermediate level. And you know, the intermediate level can take you years, right? It could be a really long time that you can keep working before you say, well, I want to learn something more than that. Unless you're a real keener, right? If you really want to, to, to go, you know, if you want to dive right into the ancient philosophers, go for it, right? But um, you don't have to. There's a lot you can do before you get to that state. I think it's important to mention that. So I'm trying to think of a reason why, let's say, some magicians who already have a really um, dedicated practice what would be a benefit for them? Like, I can see the benefit. I can see how, just even from a symbolic point of view, like bringing in some of that East to that Western magic, it's much more balanced just from that point of view, that's also important. But like a magician who's already super busy with all their altars and their, you know, they're reading whatever, texts that they're reading, they're learning whatever systems they're learning, and they're initiating into whatever system. To me, the I Ching, it sounds like a sort of, because there are no deities involved in here, that you can put it into all these systems and it provides a deeper layer. Again, it's like the, what, 3,000 years of, of Chinese civilization, that thought being brought into it. But I'm sure there's a lot of people who are going to be like, they just this I Ching, it sounds like a lot. And it sounds like uh, it sounds sort of like a divination system gone wild, you know. <laughs> so, so it's kind of like I can imagine a lot of magicians being like, "Well, 
okay, so maybe they read that, you know, Crowley, he was into it. But Crowley was into it just a lot of wild stuff. So they're just yeah. thinking, okay, maybe this is just that wild stuff. This is just, you know, like people loving to exoticize the East and just trying to be like, you know, that special person who like does that thing that nobody else does. But what's like the really just really substantial benefit for a beginning magician, especially, to to study I Ching? In the first place, you're right. There's, you know, a lot of magic can be a kind of a rabbit hole, right? And and if you're like talking about high magic, right? Like the magic of Crowley and, uh, you know, Thelema, chaos magic, even though chaos magic is a bit more loosey goosey. And, uh, you know, the grimoire magic that's very popular today, all that sort of stuff, you know, with the kids. <laughs> but uh, all of that, all of that sort of stuff, it's very easy to get super intellectualized, right? And I know a ton of people, I've, I've met a lot of occultists over the years, and I met a ton of them that, you know, they can talk your head off for five hours about the Kabbalah, right? And then you go, okay, but what have you done, right? Like, what rituals yeah. are you done? Oh, well, I, I did the banishing ritual of the pentagram, and I've been to a Gnostic mass, and, you know, I kind of hung out with a group of Wiccans for a while that, like, had, a, you know, a dinner every, you know, seasonal the every equinox and solstice, you know, or something like that. And that's it, right? Like there's no, there's no actual doing of something. One of the things I think that's important to get with, with the I Ching is that if you're looking at it just like this kind of cosmology, the way people do with the, with the Kabbalah, um, you can get kind of lost in it of, because it, it is, it's fascinating, right? I get, I get that. I'm an intellectual guy, so I get that, right? Um, but... The, the, the important thing about the, the I Ching is the practical side of it. And for an ordinary person, let's say that you're not really just talking about a magician. For an ordinary person, the, the important thing about the I Ching that I would try to explain to them is, is that um, we're, we're always trying to look in our lives for some kind of formula, right? This is what the people that look for. Um, look in the Kabbalah or look obsessively at the I Ching or stuff like that. They get really into these complex metaphysical systems, whichever system it is, Enochian or Merkaba or whatever, right? Um, they're trying to find that, that secret recipe, that formula that you can then apply to everything and it'll fix everything. It'll fix your life, it'll fix everything, right? Um, the, the Kabbalists actually um, have a teaching about this, which People don't, I, I think people don't get that that's kind of the point of it is that, the, you know, the four letter name of God in the, in the Kabbalah, right? Um, you're supposed to be forbidden from speaking it, right? And, and um, no one knows the right way to pronounce it, right? And according to, to the Kabbalistic legend, if even if you ever could pronounce it right, if someone actually found the right way to pronounce it, it would end the world, right? So what they're saying is there is no perfect word, right? There is no perfect little magic spell that's going to be applicable everywhere and solve everything, right? If, if, if that happened, the world wouldn't be what the world is, right? The world is by its nature imperfect because only through imperfection can change happen. The I Ching is all about change, right? It tells you the same thing. There's these 64 hexagrams that represent the world of 10,000 things, which is the old-fashioned Chinese way of saying everything, right? Everything in the world is represented by these hexagrams. These hexagrams have different lines, and the lines will sometimes change so that then eventually that hexagram becomes a different hexagram. Nothing ever stays still, not for very long, right? Everything in the world slowly alters into something else. Change is inevitable. That's why in the I Ching, there are 64 hexagrams, but the 63rd hexagram is called after ending, right? It's basically the end. And then you get hexagram 64, it says before ending. Right. And that that little twist is meant to say nothing ever ends. Right. Like that the whole that it's a it's a constant cycle of change. So within that change, which is the only real constant that exists, you can never apply one formula. If you have one idea, one ideology, one religion, one dogma, and you try to apply that together to everything and forever. You know, this is why religions get so messed up, right? Somebody came up with a system that worked really, really good in, you know, Judea in 30 AD or in, you know, Arabia in the 7th century. 
And then they try to apply it and they say, okay, we lock it down. That's it. This is how it all works. This is the answer to everything. And then, you know, a thousand years later, it's a, it's a freaking disaster. We want to find that because we want to find perfection. We don't get, people don't get that the, the path to perfection is what matters. It's not perfection itself. You never get to perfection. It's all about approaching it, right? About how you change in that journey. So what the I Ching teaches is that there is no right thing to do in every moment. Instead, what there is is a way to understand what is the right thing to do in every moment. And, and if you know that, then that changes the way you live, right? Then you can learn how to, how to find the right way to act in this moment, which will be different than the right way to act in the last moment the, the, or, or the next moment, right? The right way to act right now could be absolutely the wrong way to act, you know, in a year or in a different place, in a different time, right? So as far as the magician is concerned, what can they use it for practically is that the I Ching obliges you to do practice, right? It obliges you to, um, to actually work with it for you to really understand it. If you never do a casting, you'll never understand it. And that's, that's a big part of what, um, <clears throat> what happened in this kind of conflict about the I Ching over the course of centuries in Confucian China. In China from like, you know, uh, before the, the, the first century until the, the Maoist Revolution. The I Ching was the central text, but there was always these, these kind of two groups that fought each other. There was the, the, the orthodox kind of Confucians that always said, well, you know, this fortune-telling business, that's not what's important. It's important as a text and for textual study and, you know, as a test for the, the school to, for, for you to enter into the public service. And we can look at it as a history thing, but, but it's all this, you know, magical stuff is nonsense, right? And then you had all the people that ever actually mattered in terms of changing how we understood the I Ching from Confucius onwards that actually used it. All of them actually used it. And they were also all of the biggest, most famous philosophers of China, right? So they were always fighting against the mainstream of their own, of their own culture. And not in that the I Ching itself wasn't mainstream, but in that the idea of using the I Ching, of actually engaging with it, was seen as... Um, you know, something very lowly, and they're saying, no, 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 you have to use it. That's the only way you get it, right? And for some reason, this was a lesson that kept having to happen over and over again in Chinese history, and that usually within a generation after, you know, the, the great philosopher, the great sage dies, even though they're now worshipping, you know, they're, they're burning incense to the guy, they forgot that part again, right? And then the I Ching is just, oh, this superstitious book that's, that's very important to study, but not important to use, right? So you're obliged to use it, and in using it, you'll you'll discover things about the nature of um, the elements, the elemental system, that you can then apply to your other rituals. You can incorporate parts of, if you end up getting to the point, it's kind of tricky to get to the point, where you discover how the I Ching hexagrams and trigrams are used in Chinese magic, you can incorporate that into Western magic, right? This was something that that Crowley was kind of trying to invent for himself. He was trying to incorporate I Ching into his magic um, because none of the texts that, that talk about that, and there's very few texts that, that do because most of them are secret things that happen in secret schools in China. Um, those texts weren't translated at this time. And now there's some of that stuff that exists. If you find that stuff, it, there's no reason why you have to only use it in the context of the, the full, the Chinese ritual. You can syncretize, right? I think that that's something very important in Western magic, <clears throat> again, because Western magic has gaps in it, right? We, 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 we've incorporated all of the history of Western magic from the, the, the grimoire period onwards is, <clears throat> is reincorporating stuff that we borrow from other traditions, even the Kabbalah, right? It was stolen from the Jews, right? It's Western Kabbalah, Hermetic Kabbalah, as we call it. It's, a, it's totally different than, well, not totally, but very different from Jewish Kabbalah, from the traditional Jewish Kabbalah that is still used in Judaism today. We, like, stripped it of a whole bunch of its Jewishness and turned it into a universal system, right, that we can kind of apply to do stuff that lets us know, you know, the connection between planets and objects and, you know, 
colors and you know all these different things. It lets us see correspondences, right? And so we incorporated that. We incorporated yoga in the 19th century and a whole bunch of stuff. I, I read books, textbooks on modern magic and stuff like that. There's a ton of stuff in there that is not Western at all, right? Like that, yeah, never mind some of the more new agey ones that talk a lot about chakras and stuff like that, right? But even like some of the concentration exercises you see in, in modern Western rituals are actually stuff that was, that was borrowed from Eastern sources, be it from India or from China, right? And I don't think that we need to see that as a bad thing. We, it's a necessary thing because Western magic is, is in part incomplete, right? And it needs to get completed by this. And there are good ways already that we've been completing it, but there are other ways that we should look at to improve the way we work in magic. Um, I'm always interested in ways to do exactly what you said, the syncretic uh, aspects of magic and just about life, of taking what I think is the most magical thing of all, which is like being in that liminal space, that crossroad, right? Of East, yeah. West, um, above, below, all that stuff. So just adding uh, I Ching into one's magic, to me, makes one able to stand in more of that liminal space anyways, which inherently is supernatural, is supernatural Sorry. and super magical. Yeah, like if you want to get really mystical about it, I've had some people say, well, okay, but what is, why does the I Ching matter to you, right? Especially because, you know, like they say, well, you're, you're already a spiritual teacher, right? So what do you, you don't use it to like find out if you're, you know, if you lost your sock or something like that. I'm like, well, no, sometimes I might, right? Because <laughs> right. Being, being a spiritual teacher doesn't mean you know where your sock is, right? Yeah. But what I say is that, that um, the eaching, when you look at its most advanced depths, you end up being able to see through time, okay? Uh, the I Ching is... One of the essential realizations you get with the I Ching is that all of time exists only here in the now, right? And it's something that is called, that's usually called incipiencies, right? Mm -hmm. um, all, everything that leads to the present was a collection of choices made in the past, right? Choices made in tiny little instants, right? And so other possibilities vanished and only one choice remained until you get to the moment, which is a kind of a singularity. It's where we are right now, that liminal space. And most people are not aware of that, right? We have this, this idea of just, you know, um, a continuity of stuff happening, right? We don't, we, we aren't on an everyday level paying attention to the, the fact that there's an eternity in the here and now, this very moment. But if you get grasp that, and part of what the I Ching does is it's a technology that lets you kind of substitute for the kind of level of awareness that you would need to grasp it um, without the I Ching, you can see in this moment all of the possible choices into the future, right? And where they could lead, right? The incipiencies, the seed of the future exists in the here and now. And at the at a kind of the start of getting that perspective, which you can use the I Ching to, to provide for you. When you do an I Ching casting, what it's showing you, the changing lines, the future hexagram, these are the incipiencies of the most likely path, right? There are advanced methods of interpreting the I Ching that let you see more than one path. Right? There's some of this that's taught in the Yifa society. Right? But later on, but when you get really profoundly into the I Ching, you're, um, you're starting to get a sense, if, if you've combined it with a meditation practice, of those incipiencies from looking at what brought us from the past to here and then what is happening in the present. You can see the course of the future, and you can see the course of the future into the, into the very distant future, right? Um, the, the, the running of current of human events. I, I have to think that was part of what was so important for Confucius because Confucius' whole effort was to create a spiritual evolution in humanity. He wanted um, human thought, human, human consciousness to be more than the barbaric thing that it was in his own time. He lived during the time of the warring states when there was just, you know, China was a big mess and there was this brutality everywhere. And so what he was trying to do was create a paradigm shift, and he did it. Humanity has gone through several of these kinds of paradigm shifts, and we're going through a paradigm shift right now. We're going through them faster than we have in the past because we went from a rational paradigm into a postmodernist paradigm, and now that postmodernist paradigm is reaching its point of decadence, right? Its point of, 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 of kind of rot, right? Like the, 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 from the baby boomers to the millennials, 
um, we can see that it's not sustainable. So another paradigm has to emerge, right? And if you want to be a, a magician, you have to be able to um, direct the future, right? And the I Ching lets you see how you can direct the future and how you can't. This is this is a, a, a vital part of that of that question that you asked earlier about how do we apply it as magicians. You have the book, The Magician's I Ching. You've Sorry. mentioned the Yifa Society. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That yes. book. You have the Yifa Society, which is you mentioned um, a, a, a collective of people who are it's, studying. The well, Ching. yeah, the Yifa Society is is what you would call a secret school, I guess, in the in, you know, in the kind of the Chinese context of it, uh -huh. right? That there were there were throughout history in that kind of a tradition, there were all these different secret schools of teaching um, in different kind of contexts. Like there were secret kung fu schools, there were secret schools of probably secret schools of calligraphy for all I know, right? Mm -hmm. But there were there were certainly secret schools of magic, right? And this is one of those. And it's a it's a complete training system that takes you step by step, starting with the kind of the basics of um, what what is in the, the book in the magician Z Ching and the basics of practicing qigong and qi meditation which you can find on my YouTube channel, the videos that introduce that basic stuff. So it begins with a meditative posture. Hey, Shu. Um, which is kind of like, if you look at those, that's your, that would be your introduction to um, the first bits of level one of the, of the Yifa Society. Right. Now, if someone is interested in really seriously going through a program of spiritual training that is meant to create this kind of spiritual transformation that I've been talking about in this whole interview, um, people could get in touch with me, um, contact me, friend me on Facebook, or uh, you know, send me an email or whatever, and uh, and ask about the Yifa Society. It's a small group. And it's, you know, that you actually have to, like, fill in an application to, 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 to join because I don't want to be one of these guys that, you know, and it's not, it's not a method. It's not an easy, you know, <clears throat> something you do in a weekend workshop or some sort of nonsense like that, right? It's a, it's a training program of long-term practice and study that uh, you, you have to um, be dedicated to. So it's not something that's going to have 100,000 people doing it, right? It's something that is, uh, you know, it's a small school for people that actually want to learn, which is, you know, I kind of got tired of, of um, trying to uh, connect to people that aren't really interested in, in doing, um, in seriously committing to it, right? So this is for people that really want to get into it, right? But there's a lot, an intermediate stuff before that, right? There's reading my book, or if you want to learn more about the I Ching without, you know, doing something like joining the Yifa Society, there's the Magicians I Ching Facebook group that I know that you're you're a member there. It's probably the biggest I Ching group on Facebook. It has I don't know how many. Uh, I think it, it, it's got well over two thousand members now, um, and you can join it. You know, it's, everybody's welcome to join, and uh, we talk about the I Ching. We post stuff there. People ask questions. People put art related to the I Ching. There's been poetry. There's been like beginners asking totally beginner questions and you're very welcome to do so. And then there's like really profound discussions about like details of, of minutia of I Ching or the history of the I Ching or stuff like that. So it's a whole range of stuff for anybody who's interested in the I Ching. And you're, you're not, there's no such thing as being too much of a beginner or too advanced to join that group. It's a group for everybody. Yeah, guys. So if you have any sort of uh, feelings, uh, any revelations after hearing this, especially I think for a lot of people, maybe they're now thinking, oh, yeah, being a magician is about occupying that liminal space. So it doesn't have to be just about doing their Western magic. How can you guys incorporate other uh, traditions into your own magical rituals, your magical stuff every day, that's going to only enhance what you're already doing. Thank you so much, Swamiji. This has been a super long, super <laughs> long conversation. We've only touched the surface, like yeah. literally. Thank, super thank you very much for inviting me in the first place. I'm, I'm 
I'm very grateful about that. And 